Okay, so this was our talk, and now we're going to give the floor to, uh, to Peter Moskowitz. Uh, Peter. Uh, so Peter is a, a journalist from, uh, from New York, and he came up with the best book title ever. <laughs> it's the best book title ever, How to Kill a City. So, I mean, so, uh, so I, I just heard that if you put this slide on for 30 seconds, everyone is going to buy the book. So mm -hmm. I really would recommend it. I bought it straight away just because of the title, and it's a fantastic... Uh, uh, it gives a lot of insights about gentrification. This is his first appearance outside the U.S., I heard, so mm -hmm. it's also a great way to connect to, from the U.S. situation to Europe. So, Peter. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, yeah, thanks for having me. This is my book. Um, <laughs> um, and, yeah, I guess um, I'm going to... I'll talk a little bit about why I wanted to write this book um, and a little bit about my findings, but I wanted to leave a good 10 minutes at least to answer questions or have a conversation because I feel like that's uh, most elucidating for everyone. Um, so I grew up in the West Village in Manhattan. Um, and if you're not familiar with it, it's a, a, a kind of residential neighborhood in Lower Manhattan. Um, it's also where Jane Jacobs wrote um, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. I grew up about three blocks away from uh, Jacobs Brownstone. Um, and as of now, that brownstone is a real estate office, so <laughs> uh, that gives you a sense of how the neighborhood's changed. It's also worth about $5 million as opposed to $50,000, which is how much she bought it for. Um, I, yeah, so that neighborhood growing up, it was a great neighborhood to grow up. Um, it was safe. I could walk to school by myself when I was 10 years old. Um, and it was the neighborhood that, that Jacobs used as an example of, you know, kind of what neighborhoods in all cities should be, right? They should be diverse. They should uh, have a variety of buildings. They should um, uh, have tree-lined streets and access to public transportation. Um, they should have all of these things that we think of as these great place-making tools. Um, and, and that's how we foster... Uh, that's how we foster great, inclusive, diverse, um, dynamic neighborhoods, right? If you fast forward to today, though, the problem is that, in my view, the West Village is uh, a dead neighborhood. Um, it's, a, it's become a playground for millionaires and billionaires. Uh, most of the uh, independent shops along Bleecker Street, um, where I would hang out after elementary school, um, uh, are closed and have been replaced by uh, places like Gucci and Marc Jacobs. Um, most of the pizza store, like you can't even get a slice of pizza in my neighborhood anymore, which always pisses me off. <laughs> um, and it's just, it's become less and less dynamic and uh, uh, I can't really imagine growing up there, what it must be like for kids now. Um, my parents fortunately uh, still live there. They, they bought a, an old school kind of loft apartment uh, back in the 80s for almost no money. Um, but now all their neighbors are investment bankers. The guy that lives next to them is a, a wartime contractor who works in Iraq. Um, and uh, all the kids growing up there now get picked up uh, in, in car services and limos um, in the morning to be brought to school. So it's not quite the same neighborhood anymore. Um, when I, when I came back to the village after college, I looked around and said, how did this happen? Um, but not only how did this happen, how did this happen seemingly everywhere at the same time? Uh, I was working at Al Jazeera America as a reporter. Um, this was back in like 2011, 2012. And I was fortunate enough to be traveling around to all these other cities, uh, mostly in the US, um, and seeing the exact same thing happening, right? Um, I would go to New Orleans and people would have the same complaints about uh, their neighborhood changing, about where did this new condo building on the corner come from, about why did my rent double over the last five years? Um, and I'd see that everywhere, not only major cities like New York or San Francisco, but New Orleans, Detroit, Philadelphia, Austin, really everywhere. Yet, when I looked at the mainstream press coverage of gentrification, all I saw were, were descriptions of, you know, mustachioed hipsters uh, moving in and fixing up places, the new coffee shop on the corner, or how it's great that there's a new pocket park or pop-up project, or all of these kind of buzzwords. Um, and, you know, I thought two things. One, this story is not telling of all the violence and destruction that's taking place um, in order to get these kinds of new amenities in a neighborhood. Um, and two, 
Um, I'm not seeing a why. A why is this happening? Why is this not only happening in New York, but it's happening in essentially every single city uh, in the United States that has a population above 100,000 people, uh, and in, in most international cities, too. Um, so this book, I spent a month um, reporting in four different cities, um, kind of embedding in each. Uh, the cities were New York, uh, New Orleans, Detroit, and San Francisco. Um, and what I found is that gentrification as, uh, uh, is not an accident. It's, it's not a, a kind of bottom-up phenomenon, uh, the, the collective uh, result of a million hipsters' individual wills. It is a purposeful government-run program uh, that incentivizes uh, the living of some people and disincentivizes the lives of others. Um, and I think that's what gentrification is at the end of the day. Um, Yes, it involves displacement. Yes, it involves the changing of places. Um, but if you look at a place like Detroit or New Orleans, um, where there's much more space to develop, right? There's more space in Detroit to make new buildings um, than there is in New York. Yet, it, yet the gentrification there has the exact same effect as it does in New York. And that's because gentrification is not just about buildings. And it's not just about displacement. It's about governments favoring the lives of some people over others. So in my view, how gentrification happened has to do a lot with how cities are funded. And uh, this is particularly true in the United States. Um, if you go back to the 1970s in the United States, the top tax rates on the richest Americans uh, were in the uh, high 70%. So if you were making millions of dollars a year, you got uh, you know, most of that money taken out in income tax. And what do, you, what do taxes fund? They fund uh, public schools, public transit, um, uh, public housing, um, and you know, everything else you kind of need to make a city function. Fast forward to today, and uh, the top tax rate on the richest Americans is, I think, about 32%. Um, so that's already half of what it was in the 1970s. Um, and with all the tax breaks uh, they get, the effective tax rate is more like 15%. Um, so right there, that's trillions of dollars um, that used to be in the coffers of governments uh, being kind of ripped out from city governments and the federal government. So you're left in this situation where cities are essentially forced to compete uh, for rich people in order to survive. They need them there in order to fund uh, the, everything that is required for a city to function. Um, and this is where you kind of get the Richard Florida strategy of gentrification, right? Bring in the creative class, bring in um, as many uh, you know, young, upwardly mobile people as possible, and then you can tax them through property taxes, through sales taxes, through everything else, um, and through the companies that come there uh, to, uh, to hire those people, uh, and you can tax them. And that's the only way you can make a city function, particularly in the United States these days. And that's how you get in this really unfortunate situation where even New York, which is one of the richest cities in the world, is broke somehow, right? It doesn't have enough money to make its subway function. Its schools are overcrowded. Its public housing is dilapidated, even though it has trillions of dollars th flowing through it. Um, nonetheless, gentrification, even though you know, cities like New York, in my opinion, prove that it, it doesn't really work as an economic strategy, it's an attractive one um, because it's easy. Uh, it's much easier as a city government to say, if we plant a few trees here, if we incentivize an art gallery to open, if we, um, if we uh, even open a new subway stop, let's say, that'll attract new people and that'll save our city. It's much easier to do that than to say, we've stopped f funding public housing, we've stopped funding uh, public services, we've abolished our social safety net, um, and we've uh, failed to regulate our land market and housing market, um, and, and therefore our cities are becoming more and more unequal. That's, that's hard, that's hard to confront, and cities don't wanna do that. Um, but it's my belief that if we ever wanna ch uh, challenge gentrification, if we ever wanna make things um, actually equal, we have to get to those uh, those bigger issues, or else we're just going to be kind of chipping away at the edges. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the what I found in some of the cities that I went to, and uh, I started the book in New Orleans because it's almost this kind of caricature version of how gentrification works. Uh, after Hurricane Katrina, um, back in 2005, when the city was essentially totally evacuated, the city used that as an opportunity to gentrify. 
the governor of Louisiana at the time, Kathleen Blanco, said only a week after Katrina, it took the storm of a lifetime to create the opportunity of a lifetime. She then went about disbanding the entire public school system, shut down every single public school and turned them into charter schools. Uh, they fired every unionized teacher in the public school system and the, the teachers union as it is in most cities uh, was a bastion of uh, black middle class wealth um, and made those teachers reapply for their jobs competing against mostly white, mostly northern volunteers who didn't have to be paid uh, from nonprofits like Teach for America. They closed down every single public housing project in New Orleans, even though most of them were not affected by the storm, but they nonetheless used the storm as an opportunity to shut them down and slowly replace them with quote unquote mixed income uh, developments that house about a third as many people as they did before the storm. Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency was found to systemically give black families less money to rebuild uh, their houses than white families. Um, and uh, there was a lawsuit that, that uh, showed that. Um, and there were all these more subtle ways that, that uh, gentrification was kind of encouraged. And uh, a few weeks out of, after the storm, con uh, the conservative columnist David Brooks wrote in the New York Times about how uh, if we let New Orleans rebuild as it was before the storm, then we're gonna have all the same problems. It's gonna be a poor city again, it's gonna be a crime-ridden city again, so why would we let that happen, right? Um, and I just found that uh, interesting that, that people could be so public about what their actual intent was. Their intent was to not let poor black people back into the city after the storm. So today, New Orleans, uh, is back to its pre-storm population of about 450,000 people. Um, and if you listen to the city talk about it, uh, New Orleans is doing great. Its economy is, is back to where it was. It's actually richer than it was before the storm. Um, there's a lot of new development. Um, there's uh, a lot of new industry, like the movie industry has been doing a lot uh, in New Orleans. Um, and there are all these you know, new kind of urban works projects going on. The only problem is that rent is about twice as expensive as it was before the storm, and there are 100,000 fewer African Americans living in New Orleans than there were before Katrina. 100,000 out of 450,000 people. So I always am just floored by that stat every time I read it. Um, if, you, if you look at Detroit, you can kind of see the same thing happening right now. Detroit, as I said, is this huge place. Uh, it's 150 square miles, if not larger. Um, it used to have two million people in it. It now has 700,000 people in it. So there's lots of space to develop. And yet the exact same thing is happening there uh, that's happening in New Orleans, that's happening in New York, and that's happening in all these other cities. Um, if you look at, at where Detroit is investing, it's investing in this little area called the 7.2, the 7.2 square miles that make up uh, the center of the city. Um, and it's essentially partnered with millionaires and billionaires to, uh, to uh, create their own city. There's this area of downtown where Dan Gilbert, the owner of Quicken Loans, owns 90 buildings. Most of them are multi-story buildings and a lot of them are, are like 20, 30-story uh, towers. He owns 90 of them. Uh, and he owns so many that uh, residents call uh, the area Gilbertville. He also has his own private security force that works uh, with the police uh, in Detroit, um, but that's not actually accountable to, to the public. Uh, meanwhile, the rest of Detroit is kind of being cut off from social services until a few years ago. There wasn't regular garbage collection in many neighborhoods in Detroit. Uh, there weren't street lights in many neighborhoods in Detroit. Um, and uh, water uh, was being shut off to tens of thousands of residents for owing something like $20, $30 in, in uh, back payments to their water bill. So what the city is essentially doing is even though there's so much space to create, to create uh, environments that are meant for everyone, they're just focusing on enriching the already rich areas of the city and in my opinion, purposely cutting off the rest of the city, the poorer residents. And so you see Detroit's population is still dropping because people in those outer areas, namely black families, are still leaving because the city isn't working for them and they're going out to the suburbs. And meanwhile, the city is shrinking and becoming whiter in its center. Um, Detroit is, is a great place to talk about 
how, how planning contributes to that inequality. Without a government focused on, uh, on planning for equality, this is the kind of city you get. You get a city that's essentially too uh, unequal and separate populations. Um, and if you, if you go to that area of, of Gilbertville, or the adjacent area of Midtown where all the universities of Detroit are uh, and all the art institutions, they essentially get to be their own planning departments, right? They've done all these great uh, placemaking initiatives. They built a new rail line that goes from one gentrified area of Detroit to another. Um, and uh, you know, there are new little uh, parks, there are new, uh, uh, they're experimenting with a street grid, they're doing all these things that on paper look great. But essentially, it's, it's a privatized form of placemaking. It's all these institutions saying, this is what we want. And because this, the city government is so weak, uh, so broke, um, and, uh, and has uh, no real power, all it does is essentially uh, approve a, of these plans, right? So you have private organizations, like museums, like schools, uh, like private real estate developers, making their own cities within cities. Uh, and what does that do? That means that everyone, who, who can't afford to do that, who can't afford to, uh, uh, to create their own plans for a city ends up disadvantaged. They end up not having the tools to actually have an influence over how their city functions. Um, I'm gonna just fast forward through San Francisco and New York because I wanna leave time for questions. Um, but if you, if you look at San Francisco and you look at New York, I think you kind of get what the end goal of gentrification is. It's not about people, um, it's, not, it's not about anything except capital and, uh, and how to grow it. If you go to 57th Street in New York right now, right next to Central Park, there are all these 100-story uh, uh, residential skyscrapers that are going up. And uh, the apartments there range from $20 million to over $100 million. And the funny thing is no one actually lives in them. They are uh, owned by banks, they're owned by investment companies, they're owned by shady foreign billionaires um, from a variety of countries. And in my, in my view, this is the kind of purest distillation of what gentrification is. It's a way to turn a city into a machine to produce money. And what does that do when your city is essentially a machine to produce money? It means it's not tenable as a place for people. So you can see that on a small scale in every gentrifying neighborhood when rents increase, when, uh, when it becomes harder to live there. And you can see that in San Francisco, in neighborhoods in London, uh, in, in uh, neighborhoods in New York, where the, where the neighborhood is no longer a neighborhood anymore. It's essentially a bank of real estate. Um, and I think that's what we r really risk happening everywhere if we don't tackle this problem. A lot of European cities are, are better off than American cities because they uh, have a, a bigger social safety net, because they have higher minimum wages, because they have more public housing. Um, but this idea of, of turning your city into a capital machine is really uh, pervasive and attractive, especially for uh, uh, cities in, in the developing world. As I said, it's much harder to tackle these problems of inequality. Uh, it's much harder to, to look in the mirror and say, how did this uh, world become so unequal? It's much easier to say, we can become rich, we can fund our city, we can make our books look good if we just bring enough capital here. Um, and uh, that's, what, that's what a lot of cities in the developing world are doing. Um, unfortunately, I think when you do that, you end up uh, creating some of the most unequal cities on Earth. Uh, sorry to end on such a down note, <laughs> um, but <laughs> uh, it's not an uplifting book if you're looking for an uplifting read. Uh, <laughs> um, but with that, yeah, I'd love to open it up to, to questions. Thanks. Can I uh, introduce myself? I'm Michael Mahaffey, and I'm a co-organizer of the conference, and I'm going to help uh, with the Q&A, and then I'm going to follow up after Peter uh, with some additional uh, thoughts. Um, anybody have quick questions? Uh, questions, comments, responses? One right there. Okay. Um, Peter, you are... Um, 
Oh, sorry. My name is Minouche Besters. I'm from Stipa. I'm a colleague of Jeroen. I was wondering, um, what is it that we can do as governments to not end up in a situation like that? Is there some strategies that you also give in your book? Yeah, I mean, there are several things. Um, I'm a really big fan of universal rent regulation um, because, to me, that uh, kind of renders other conversations moot. Like, if you... The problem, the problem right now is, let's say you want to put in a new park into a neighborhood. In, the, in an unregulated real estate market, that park becomes a tool for real estate development and displacement. So you get this really unfortunate situation where, especially in poor neighborhoods, people say, oh, we want new parks, we want new public transportation, we want, we want all the things that you, know, you think of when you think of gentrification. Um, the only problem is when you put those things there, everyone gets priced out and has to move. So they, the amenities end up not being for those people. Um, with, uh, with rent regulation, with rent control, that, uh, that's not a concern anymore because all of a sudden there's no incentive, uh, or at least less of incentive, uh, an incentive to uh, kick those people out. Um, so that's, that's happened in Berlin right now. I think uh, Berlin's an interesting example where they, I forget the exact law, but the, a landlord now can't raise rent, I think, more than 10 or 15% when a new person moves into an apartment. So it, doesn't, it hasn't solved the problem, but it's, it's disincentivized displacement in a lot of ways. Um, and I mean, that public housing, I think, is always great. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, and it's, you, know, you don't have to be a socialist uh, or communist economy to like, really invest in public housing. Um, Singapore, for example, like something like 50% of their, their new construction is public housing. So, um, so yeah, those are, those are the two big ones for me. Can I ask a quick follow-up question? Um, what about things like uh, land value tax, um, the model that I know a number of cities in Europe have done of um, essentially dampening down the speculative um, you know, commodification of real estate and using the funding from that to invest in public housing, th things like that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not an expert in like land value taxes and stuff like that, but um, I think I think anything to regulate land markets is a step in the right direction. Um, it, that's, that's the problem you have, especially in places like New York where there's such limited space. Um, and it's, it's actually not even only about limited space. New York uses zoning not to promote equality, but to promote real estate values. Like they only open up enough area of development at a time uh, to keep uh, apartment prices kind of high at all times. Um, which, you know, in some ways is good because you don't, get overbuilding, you don't get a, a bubble necessarily, although we might be in one right now, um, and uh, you don't get like the, the ebbs and flows uh, as much of a housing market. But at, yeah, at the same time, they're, they're just regulating how much can be built. They're not regulating anything else. So I think if, if governments have more control over land, um, that's, that's a way to, yeah, to help. Hello. Yeah, my name is Todor. I'm representing Placemakers from Bulgaria Collective Informal. First of all, Peter, I would like to congratulate you for using the real words for things in the world as we are living. It's good to see that people still do that. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, I guess it relates to a lot of people that were gathered for that conference. Is you made obviously a lot of research on that, but how do you see us professionals who work with uh, bottom-up uh, approaches with uh, grassroots urbanism. How do, how, how do you see us in the big picture and what we can do according to yeah, your research? Um, you mean like what, like what do you... Well, community yeah. planning, community-based yeah. planning from bottom-up, so not representative of the government, but more of yeah, pure professionals that want to change the game. Yeah, I mean, I think it's hard because these are these are questions of power and like who holds power, um, and you know, architecture, design, placemaking. They, a lot of people have made strides towards including you know community in their in their decision process, right? Of hear, holding community listening sessions and uh, you know getting community inputs on everything. But if you don't actually let those people have power over what happens in the end, then it doesn't really uh, do much uh, except pay lip service to the community, right? So New York is a great example of this, where uh, our mayor Bill De Blasio has said, you know, we're going to always ask the community at every step of the way um, 
you know, what do they want? And they do that. They hold dozens of community listening sessions before every rezoning and every development, and then they completely ignore everything everyone <laughs> says and do what they want anyway. Um, so to me, you know, listening is one thing, and another is building enough community power to, to have an actual sway over things. And I think, unfortunately, this is also just a problem of inequality. Um, you know, people often accuse me of being a, a NIMBY and not in my backyard, right, because I don't want huge developments in poor neighborhoods. That's not what I am. You know, building a 100-story public housing project in the West Village, I don't care. Um, but that's never going to happen because the people who live in the West Village ha actually have a say over what happens in their neighborhood, and the people who live in East New York and bed do not. Um, so until, uh, until that changes, I'm, I'm not sure how powerful community uh, collaboration can be until it actually involves power. Thanks. That's a great point. Just wondering if you, oh, my name's Vishnu, I'm a student at KTH. Um, was just wondering if you have any suggestions for empowering these communities um, and giving them a voice in these situations. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are a couple of, like, I guess, urban planning ways to do that, like um, community benefits agreements are, are kind of all the rage these days in, uh, in the United States, and they're, they've been pretty effective in Detroit. Um, basically, it's saying, like, if you build, you know, with a project worth X amount of money or uh, if you are getting tax revenue or tax breaks in order to build a project, then you have to uh, contract with the surrounding community uh, and specify, you know, uh, certain things like how many people from that community will be hired, um, how many, uh, what the wages will be for the construction project and, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that's a local way to do things. Um, but I think there are more, you know, in my opinion, having a high minimum wage and socialized health care and free education are much w better ways to empower a community uh, than, uh, than, let's say, a community benefits agreement. Because, you know, as I said, the problem is power. If you are struggling, if you have to work three jobs, if you uh, don't have time to protest your local development, then you just have less power. If you uh, live in a society that supports your life, um, then you actually have the time, the energy, uh, and the resources to do something about it. So in a lot of ways, yeah, I think like uh, a higher minimum wage is even a, a better way to ameliorate gentrification than even something like public housing. Uh, one more question. Thank you. Uh, I'm, oh, I'm, Nupur, uh, I'm a landscape architect from India. Uh, you really hit the nail on the head for me. I mean, I come from a very dif different context, but the whole idea of inequality and the incentivization and de-incentivization is exactly what's happening in our cities in India. And what just two points I want to bring forth here. Point number one is when you talk about power and you talk about money. And I feel because every indicator today, especially in the developing world, is about it's a financial indicator. Right. So it's just killing everything that you know, there is for us as, as professionals. Uh, number two is the whole idea of the digital and the physical. Mm. So while the Indian um, economy is doing great, uh, India is one of the highly digitized societies, I don't know why we are not able to see the difference that between the digital and the physical. Right. Physically, the cities are disintegrating, people are disappearing from any decision-making table, and yet, we keep feeling better and better about things. Right. You know, and, and here I would just like to highlight the, uh, the Bulgarian colleague's question about what professionals like us should be doing. And I find that in this whole melee, uh, professionals, uh, planners, architects, landscape architects in India are actually removing themselves. Mm. They, are, they are removed. Right. But they're also removing themselves from the whole decision-making table uh, by involving themselves only in very high niche, iconic projects and not really engaging with the government because it is very frustrating. Right. So it's, it's a very, uh, it's, I mean, you've ended on a dismal note. I'm going to end this <laughs> comment also on a very dismal note that it is actually a very dismal situation. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I mean, and I think your point gets to the kind of like the corporatized model of, of city governments, uh, governance and governance in general. When you're, look, you're looking at your city as kind of a, a uh, profit balance sheet, like how much money are we bringing in, how many jobs are there, uh, all, all the cities that are experiencing gentrification crises, like I always think of San Francisco, where 
if you talk to the politicians there, you know, things are going great and they're bringing it, they have a $19 billion budget surplus projected in the next 10 years um, because there's so much tech money there. And, then, and yet they did a survey that showed that 50% of all Bay Area residents are planning on leaving sometime soon because of housing prices. <laughs> so that gives you the idea of the disconnect between like what looks good on paper versus what's actually good good for people. And sorry, I know, I'm, but one, yeah, one more thing I want to say is, yeah, it's totally frustrating and you know, I gave a talk at the Philadelphia Urban Planning Department recently and like everyone there was totally on board with what I was saying, but just looked totally depressed and withdrawn and, you know, people have been banging their heads against the walls trying to get these things done, but governments are so attracted to this idea of, of gentrification that it's really hard to, to turn the tide in the other direction. Yeah, thanks. Terrific. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone.